For a long time, Shadow Dragon was the only translated Fire Emblem game that I hadn't completed. I bought it when it came out after loving the GBA and Tellius games only to bounce off of it pretty hard. I remember not being alone in that when the game came out. Perception of this game is pretty rough, a lot of people haven't played it, and a lot of people like me did play it and didn't like it when it released. However, replaying the game more recently, I've become a pretty big fan of Shadow Dragon, so I'm going to talk about why I bounced off it in the first place, and what made me change my mind about the game. I hope if you're on the fence about the game, or if you don't like it, you'll bear with me here. Before we really dive into it though, a big thank you to my patrons, Ike Poo, Lucy Sev, Danny Doyle, Helix, and Acrobatic Jazz. Your support is really appreciated, and if you want to support the channel and get early access to videos, you'll find a link to the Patreon in the video description. Okay, back to Shadow Dragon. I want to start with talking about why I didn't like it at first, and what the game isn't, as I think to enjoy Shadow Dragon it's important to approach it a little differently than modern FE games, which makes sense, it's a remake of the first ever game. The elephant in the room though is actually the presentation. DS era Fire Emblem is a pretty big departure from previous entries in its aesthetic. We went from the more colorful GBA and Tellius games to a more muted palette. You see more washed out colors and shades of grey here compared to the often brightly colored games that preceded it. There's nothing inherently wrong with this choice, and in some ways I think it adds to the feeling of being in a war, but on a personal level I like my Fire Emblem games colorful, so this was an L for me. Beyond the palette, the art style is also quite different than previous games, and we can see this most in the portraits. The portraits are done in a more realistic style and with very neutral expressions, and honestly, I think these portraits get a little too much shit. There are some bad ones for sure, I don't really like how Marth looks in this game, and the new mystery version of him was definitely a glow up, but I think if you can look past Marth, there are a lot of nice portraits to be found here. Here's a few that I'm particularly fond of. My only real beef with Shadow Dragon portraits is that I don't like how not expressive they are, especially when compared to something like FE3. A couple good examples of this are Rickard and Rad. This is a game where most characters don't get a ton of dialogue, so the portrait is a nice place to show the player a bit of each character's personality. When we look at Rickard's portrait from FE3, we can see his lightheartedness and silliness, and in Rad's portrait, I read a little cockiness from that smirk of his. The Shadow Dragon portraits for these characters don't look bad, in fact I'm quite fond of Rad's hair. But they tell me less about the character, which is unfortunate because again, these guys really don't have that much dialogue. The animations are another sticking point in this game, and I don't have much of a defense for these. Especially coming not too long after peak combat animations in the GBA games, I don't really like these ones. They're quick and very simple, which some people like since it keeps the action moving, but for me it just makes me want to turn them off. There are some cool crit animations, but in most Fire Emblem games I like to keep the animations on for at least my first playthrough, and in Shadow Dragon I kinda want to turn them off immediately. This isn't really a deal breaker for me, because like I said, I usually turn animations off eventually anyway, but it would be nice if they looked a bit nicer. The last thing I want to touch on for Shadow Dragon's presentation is the between chapter CGs, which I think are fantastic. Here I think the muted palette works really nicely. The CGs look almost like pictures you might see in a history book, and I love that. Overall, I think my issue with Shadow Dragon's presentation isn't any of the individual pieces so much, as it's that it seems to present a more serious tone, almost as though aping historical documentaries, but I don't think the rest of the game necessarily matches that. Shadow Dragon isn't a more serious game than your average Fire Emblem, or at least not by any significant amount, and the aesthetic doesn't totally match the tone of the writing for me. Okay. I wanted to start with that one because the aesthetic of Shadow Dragon is the thing I have the least nice things to say about. I don't think it's as bad as it's made out to be, but I understand people disliking the art style. Another common criticism of Shadow Dragon is that it's one of the weakest stories in the franchise, and honestly, this one I just disagree with. Shadow Dragon's story is very straightforward and delivered succinctly, but I think it's also effective. We kick off with a young Marth, angry and helpless as his kingdom of Altea and family have been taken from him and we follow him on his journey to take his kingdom back. A simple enough plot, but I like seeing Marth develop and take on his responsibility as a ruler. If we play the prologue, we get to see Marth's reaction immediately after fleeing Altea. He wallows in his guilt, ashamed to have been unable to save his sister or his kingdom, and swears revenge on his enemies. Marth's survivor's guilt is one of the most effective motivations a lord has had to start their adventure to me. 
but as the game continues, we get to see it become less about revenge and more about supporting his people. This shift in Marth's motivation culminates in Chapter 17, when Marth finally retakes Altea only to discover that his mother has been killed and his sister kidnapped. This is Marth's lowest moment in the story, devastated that there's no going back to his old, happy life. While he's offered time to mourn, he instead decides to speak to his people, delivering one of his best lines in the game, that he is a prince before he is a son or a brother. It's a bittersweet moment where we can see that Marth has grown into a capable ruler, but also that something has been lost along the way. We want Marth to be able to mourn, we want him to be able to have a happy life with his family, but this is the path that he's been set upon and the path that he's chosen. And the chapter ends with this excellent line as Marth's people cheer for the liberation of their country. The great commander's last victory of the day was commanding his tears not to flow. I love him. Marth is really cool. He's great. I feel that he's often reduced to just being a nice lord, but he experiences genuine development in Shadow Dragon and has opportunities to be clever, angry, and kind. Is he the deepest lord in the franchise? No. But his story in Shadow Dragon is compelling and delivered in short but sweet fashion. You may have noticed I've been talking about Marth a lot here, and that's because this really is Marth's story. There are other characters. I particularly enjoy Minerva and the difficult position she's in being coerced into fighting Marth. But the bulk of the story is about Marth, and most recruitable characters don't get much dialogue at all. This is also a game without support conversations, so a lot of it is carried on Marth's back. Fortunately, I think he does a good job of carrying the story. The lack of support conversations is a common criticism of Shadow Dragon, and one I generally agree with. Characters get a bit of characterization when they're recruited and via a conversation with Marth, but that's really the end of it for most units. This is enough to get you a decent first impression of a character, some of which can be really funny, such as when Sita girl bosses her way into recruiting the Armor Knight Roger. Seriously, if you haven't played this game, look up that recruitment conversation, it's really funny. But non-main characters just don't have the depth that they get in more recent Fire Emblem games. So if support conversations are your favorite part of Fire Emblem, Shadow Dragon might be a miss for you. Alright, finally, let's get into the big reason I think you should play Fire Emblem, and that's that the gameplay is really good. At its core, Shadow Dragon is Fire Emblem almost at its most basic. There aren't any movement tools like Rescue, Shove, or Pair Up, and there aren't any skills. Once you're in the map, gameplay is very straightforward. But I think Shadow Dragon is a great example of how you don't need those elements for a game to be engaging as long as the maps and scenarios are interesting. The fun of Shadow Dragon comes from how easy it is to pick up and play, and the generally good maps and difficulty design that it offers. One of the things I love about Shadow Dragon is that there's almost no burden of knowledge. In many recent Fire Emblem games, a lot of unit strength has started to come from things like skills, which can require a lot of game knowledge to make the best use of. Let's say you're playing Three Houses Maddening for the first time. How difficult of a time you'll have is heavily dependent on how well you know the skill system. Knowing how you access the best skills and which good skills units have access to can make the experience a lot easier, but these systems are generally opaque, and most players will have to learn them either by playing the game a lot or opening up a browser and googling where the skills come from. There's nothing wrong with skill-based games, beyond that I wish they were a little less opaque, and I do enjoy building crazy powerful units, but I think there's something nice about being able to load up a game for the first time and easily glean all of the critical information that's going to help you succeed. Shadow Dragon does have a little bit of hidden information, but for the most part, the critical information that you need is available to the player immediately, meaning that you get to spend more of your time thinking about how you can use the tools you have to beat each map, rather than building yourself a powerful tool and then deciding how to beat the map. Sometimes in newer games, I feel like some maps can be trivialized in the skills and prep screen before you even start. Shadow Dragon has a little less of that. I particularly enjoy the early game in Shadow Dragon where enemies are pretty strong. Your units can't really one round, and a lot of them take significant damage from enemies, even your Jagan. Let's take a look at Chapter 5. This is my favorite map in the game, and it does a lot of things I like. To start with, we get a bunch of new units that start on the left side of the map, separated from our main force. We can't immediately send all of our troops over to help them, though, because we have a few things we need to take care of on the right side of the map. There's a village, which only Marth can visit, that we need to snag before a couple thieves destroy it. And we have a recruitable character in the top right, surrounded by additional enemies. We do still want to send some units to the left, though, just to provide a little relief to our new recruits. So we're being pulled in a bunch of different directions here, and most of our units aren't strong enough to do these jobs on their own. 
So you'll be using a lot of units during these early game maps, and I think that's fun. It's great to use more of the early game wimps than I do in most Fire Emblem games. You may have also noticed that I have a lot of units for this chapter, and that's because Shadow Dragon just gives you a ton of guys. This game is definitely built around the idea of not resetting on a unit's death, and I think embracing this makes the game more fun. In my first playthrough of Hard 5, the game's hardest difficulty, one of my most memorable moments was sacrificing Gordon in Chapter 5 to save Marth. It created a much better story for Gordon in my head than had I benched him. Instead of being a loser that sat on the bench for most of the game, he got to be a heroic sacrifice for Marth. That's a better story. I like that Shadow Dragon empowers me to feel comfortable making these sacrifices because I know there will always be new units coming to replace anyone who dies. Usually there are only a few characters I'll reset for in Shadow Dragon. Whichever of the early calves I heavily invest in, Sita because I really like her personal weapon, and Jagan specifically if he dies too early in the game. Beyond that, any death is a sad loss that only strengthens Marth's resolve. Embracing permadeath in this way makes each run a different story. In my first Hard 5 run, Gordon heroically sacrificed himself, but in the next one he led the charge into Altea. For me, even though characters have very limited dialogue, I'm able to care for them and appreciate their story as it plays out in gameplay. Shadow Dragon encourages accepting permadeath in a couple ways. First, by providing you an unlimited amount of replacement units, and second, because a lot of power in this game is wrapped up in effective weaponry. Even if your best combat unit died, a weaker unit can still perform well by taking advantage of how strong weapons like the Rider's Bane and Hammer are, particularly when forged. And then, once they've killed a bunch of enemies with their effective weaponry, they may have caught up to where your previous unit left off. Something I mentioned earlier was that only Marth can visit villages, and this is a somewhat common critique of Shadow Dragon. But I actually like the effect this has on the game. Shadow Dragon is a game with infinite range warp, and every map is seized. This means that for a lot of the game, you can easily end a map by warping your strongest unit to kill the boss. Or even if you don't want to warp, rushing directly towards the boss is a valid strategy to complete most maps. Villages that only Marth can visit disincentivize this and force the player to make a choice. Do I want to rush towards the boss with my entire army and end the map before reinforcements spawn? Or should I split off a few units to escort Marth to a village, potentially facing more combat as a result, but getting whatever the village has to offer? There's no right answer. There's lots of villages that I skip because I don't value the items much, but I always hit the villages with recruitable characters. On the other hand, someone else might value the items more than me and get all of the villages, or someone might not value getting all the recruitments and skip even more villages than I do. This is going to change our approach to the maps and impact what our playthroughs end up looking like. With infinite warp range on the table, I think maps having tasks for Marth to do besides seize the throne is a good thing. I do think warp can be a bit of a problem in this game. There are an astonishing amount of maps where you can easily warp skip the map on turn 1 or 2, and you can always just choose not to use warp, and I encourage you to on your first playthrough. I think it's more fun to play through the maps. But I think it's unfortunate that you have to stop yourself from using the cool staff to preserve the difficulty of the game. Still, overall, I really like the simplicity of Shadow Dragon, and the game broadly succeeds at creating interesting scenarios without overwhelming the player. Something that helps ease players in is the variety of different difficulty settings. The game has six difficulties, ranging from Normal to Hard 1 through 5. Normal provides a nice tutorial to ease players in while higher difficulties skip it, and the enemies become more difficult with each step up the ladder of difficulty. I love this. There are often games where I wish there were more than three difficulty options, because maybe normal seems a little too easy, but hard is a little too punishing. In Shadow Dragon, it's easy to find the just right difficulty for you. And I think they scale up well. My first playthrough of Hard 5 was one of the more rewarding playthroughs of Fire Emblem that I've ever done. I love the wide variety of difficulty settings as they're great for challenge runs too. When I play a normal run, I typically play on Hard 5 but in draft runs, I often do hard 2 or 3. I love that the wide variety of difficulty settings can support different modes of play and different types of players. For the most part, everything in Shadow Dragon is going to feel familiar to anybody that's played Fire Emblem, but it does have a few new mechanics that the players will have to engage with. I'm going to talk about the two most important ones, reclassing and save tiles. Save tiles are a quick one, but I think these are genius. On most maps, there are one or two glowy tiles that you can park a unit on to save the game. I think of these as sort of the precursor to Mila's turn wheel because they serve a similar purpose, which is removing the frustration of having to reset late in a map because a unit died at the very end. In Shadow Dragon, you can just go back to a save point. 
What I really like about these is that they encourage thoughtful use by the player for a few reasons. First, the save points are at specific places on the map, so you can't just save whenever. You have to have a unit over there, so if you want to use a mid-map save point later in the map, you need to leave a unit behind or send a unit back. Especially on maps with reinforcements, this is a meaningful cost. Second, you have to choose when to use a save point. Do you use it right before the difficult section because you might die during it? Or do you use it after a difficult section so that you don't risk resetting and having to do it again? You might even think about using a save point for something totally different, like saving a good level up on a unit. So I like save points because to me they fill the important role of making resets less painful while also providing an interesting choice for players to make. Plus, designers get a little agency with them as well, as they can choose where to place save tiles where hopefully they are most interesting. I would love to see these come back in new Fire Emblem games. Next up we have the reclassing system. Shadow Dragon was the first game to introduce a flexible reclassing system where in between chapters units can change their class to one of several options. Units can basically do this freely outside of a limit on how many of each class you can have on your roster at any given time. I like this system, there's plenty of reasons why you might reclass. In my most recent playthrough, I put Barst in Mercenary for a little bit of the early game because it gave him high enough speed to double more things. I put Sedgur in general for a while to take advantage of its high defense, and I frequently switched my best horse units from Paladin to Wyvern and back again depending on which option seemed best for the map. There's lots of reasons why you might reclass a unit, but even beyond optimization, Reclassing provides lots of opportunities for silly builds and runs, and there's lots of random niche things that you can do with reclassing. For example, in a draft I played, I once reclassed Minerva into a staff user because I wanted someone to use the Om staff, and she's one of the few units that can, given a bunch of staff rank grinding, of course. There is one common criticism people make of the reclassing system in Shadow Dragon, which is that it stops units from having a strong, unique identity. And I disagree with this a little bit. I think that this would be true in many Fire Emblem games if you were to add free reclassing to them, but go play Fire Emblem 1, which didn't have reclassing, and I'll think you'll find that most of the units still don't have a strong identity to begin with. Daros doesn't feel super unique and interesting in FE1 even though he's the only pirate, and I don't think reclassing makes him feel less interesting. I do think units can lack uniqueness in Shadow Dragon, but I don't think reclassing is the culprit so much as the general lack of dialogue for most units, as well as most units having several units with surface level similarities, even if we were to ignore reclassing. So even though I miss support conversations and the aesthetic of Shadow Dragon isn't my favorite, I think it has some of the most approachable but interesting gameplay in the series. It's super fun and easy to pick up and play, and honestly, I think the story and writing is better than it's given credit for. If you're open to a straightforward story, excellent gameplay, and especially if you're willing to try embracing permadeath, I hope you'll consider giving Shadow Dragon a shot, because I think you'll like it. Thanks for sticking around to the end. If you liked the video, consider hitting the like or subscribe button, or if you want to chat more about Shadow Dragon or Fire Emblem in general, Hop in the community Discord, you'll find a link to that in the description. Either way, have yourself a lovely week.